This is Nightly Business Report with Bill Griffith and Sue Herrera. Market milestone, the NASDAQ hits 9,000 for the first time ever and the Dow and the S&P close at all time highs. Tis the season for gift returns and in a twist, that could actually be a gift for retailer sales. Losing its shine, people are leaving the Golden State in droves and it could leave a lasting mark on the world's fifth largest economy. Those stories and much more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Thursday, December 26th. And we do bid you a good evening, everybody, and welcome. Sue is off tonight. The rise in stocks just won't quit. Wall Street's three major averages closed at record highs once again today. In fact, the Nasdaq broke through 9,000 for the first time ever. It's now risen for 11 straight sessions, making it the index's longest win streak since July of 2009. And it's been quite a trip to that 9,000 level. The index was at 325 back in 1990, before the dot-com boom and bubble pushed it to 5,000 for the first time by the end of that decade. Then came the huge decline leading to the 2002 recession. In fact, it didn't get back to 5,000 until 2008, only to be hit once again by the Great Recession. It hit 8,000 last year, and today it's first close above 9,000. Here are the closing numbers for today with the Dow up 105 points. We're now at 28,621. The Nasdaq rose in 69 today, and the S&P added 16. Frank Hollins starts us off tonight on the Nasdaq's record run. The road to the Nasdaq crossing the 9,000 mark was paved with computer chips, yoga pants, and lattes. It's not surprising that chips are a major factor for the tech heavy index. AMD gaining 85%, seeing the biggest improvement since the Nasdaq crossed the 8,000 mark back in August of 2018. LAM Research and Broadcom also gaining more than 50%. Consumer stocks also pushing the Nasdaq higher. Yoga pant maker Lululemon rising 67% since the 8,000 mark. Starbucks gaining 66%. Charter Communications, one of the biggest cable providers in the nation, gaining more than 59%. The so-called FANG names, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, as well as Microsoft, had the biggest impact on the index, but they were actually mixed on the road to 9,000. Stocks, they typically get a boost this time of year, the so-called Santa Claus rally, but with the NASDAQ closing at yet another record. Some experts believe these gains could be more than just seasonal. For Nightly Business Report, Frank Holland. Also helping propel the NASDAQ this year has been Apple. It's also been the best performing stock in the Dow this year, rising about 83%. That gain has put Apple on track for its best year in a decade. So where do Apple and the rest of the tech stocks in the NASDAQ go in 2020? Chris Retzler joins us now. He's portfolio manager with the Needham Growth Fund. Chris, good to see you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Hey, Bill, how are you? Far and away, most money managers we talk to on this program, when I ask your favorite sector, it's usually technology. What about for 2020? Does the momentum continue, do you think? Well, we are planning for a bit of a correction here in the new year. We think a lot of gains where people don't want to take those taxable gains in 2019 might be pushing that out to 2020. However, longer term, we are still very bullish on technology. What we like about it is it's defendable on a global basis where they can defend that technology. It's much of what we're fighting for against China, IP protection. Right. So we remain bullish on technology going into the next year, but we think that there could be some pullback in the early months. As Frank Holland mentioned, the chip stocks, I mean, they had suffered for a few years, but suddenly a resurgence this year. Are, is that one of the groups you're looking at for a potential pullback next year? It would be an area, but semiconductors are great leading indicators for economic acceleration. So what we've been seeing since September is a real nice run in semi-cap equipment, semiconductors, which gives us some confidence that next year is still going to be a good year economically and probably an acceleration in global economic activity. 5G, that's to be a big, uh, I would think, catalyst for next year of growth for a lot of companies. That's the, the next generation wireless technology. Do you agree with that or, or are we getting our hopes too high at this point? 
I agree with that. However, I would break it down between two pieces. One is the actual infrastructure to make those devices, which also need 5G. So as you think about mobile phones, we would expect to see 5G built into those devices. However, the infrastructure to make them work, we think, could take a little bit more time, and that's probably over multiple years. So 5G really has a long tail to its investment, and it's much of what we're seeing in the semiconductor land right now, and we think that will continue for multiple years. Chris Retzler with the Needham Growth Fund. Chris, again, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. And as we close in on the end of the year and the end of the decade, there is a belief on Wall Street that the stocks and sectors that outperform one year often underperform the following and vice versa. But is the same true over longer periods of time? Bob Bassani takes a look. What a decade it has been. It started out with fear. It's ending with historic highs. Investors have been absorbed with the search for growth. That's why technology, the ultimate growth stocks, have so dramatically outperformed everything this decade, up over 300% as a group. The bottom sectors have one notable standout, energy. Oil stocks have had no gains at all for the last decade. So what's next? If history is any guide, investors should avoid the fallacy that the future is going to look exactly like the past. We've often noted that stocks and sectors that outperform one year often underperform the following year. It's called mean reversion. It's the tendency for most investments to revert to long-term averages, and it happens over long periods of time as well. So look at 2000 to 2009. The top three sectors, energy, consumer staples, materials, tended to underperform in the next decade, up only 80 percent. The bottom three sectors, Communication services, technology, financials, they tended to outperform, up 184%. This phenomenon also happened from 1990 to 2000. Technology was the best performer, and then it was the worst performer in the next decade. So why does mean reversion seem to work as an investment strategy? For the stock market, there's two explanations. First, in a capitalist system, underperforming sectors tend to be ruthlessly restructured until they're efficient. Then there's the old future fallacy. Humans tend to continue buying things that keep going up in value, creating bubbles that eventually burst. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Bob Bassani at the New York Stock Exchange. Now, Bob just mentioned the energy sector's lost decade. And in the year ahead, the industry faces a number of challenges still. Brian Sullivan has our 2020 playbook. Stagnant oil prices, heavy corporate debt loads, and environmentally conscious investors selling oil and gas stocks absolutely slammed the energy industry in 2019. All this, the U.S. reached a major milestone, becoming a net exporter of crude and petroleum products for a full month for the first time in 70 years. All this as the race for another kind of element, the so-called rare earth minerals, just began to heat up. Here's what to watch for in energy in 2020. First, a wave of bankruptcies. Unless oil prices rise, the industry and investors may have to endure a number of reorganizations. Many companies are struggling with huge amounts of debt, built up when oil prices were on the rise. And unless oil jumps in price, Wall Street is unlikely to let companies refinance or extend their obligations. Second, international resources shift. Venezuela likely loses control of Citgo. After years of courtroom battles between a hedge fund and the government of Venezuela, the final battle likely comes in 2020. And it's possible the courts ultimately rule against Venezuela, allowing Citgo to be seized, auctioned off, and bought by an American company or companies. And third, the race for rare earth minerals goes full throttle. If you want to build an environmentally sensitive project, like an electric car or a wind turbine, you need rare earth elements. These are obscure but incredibly important minerals like lithium, neodymium, and yttrium. China controls most of the world's supplies for these critical elements, but there are many projects in the works to help the U.S. catch up. This will be the battleground to watch in 2020. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Brian Sullivan. Rob Thummel joins us now to talk more about what lies ahead for the oil market in 2020. He's a portfolio manager at Tortoise Advisors. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks, Bill. And actually, you think that 2020 will mark a return for the U.S. energy sector. What do you mean? Well, as uh, Brian and others have talked about, you know, 20, the, the last decade was a bad one for, for the energy sector. But going forward, we see a lot of opportunities and catalysts for the energy sector. The biggest one is what Brian highlighted. The U.S. is now a net energy exporter. Mm -hmm. So going forward in the next decade, 2020 and beyond, there's a significant opportunity for investors to capitalize on the opportunity in the U.S. as the U.S. becomes a large supplier of all energy commodities to the rest of the world. Do you see prices going higher? And who will set those prices? Is that still OPEC that has the power to do that? 
or does the U.S. industry have the power now? Well, going forward, oil will still remain relevant and, and somewhat important, um, but natural gas and, and renewables actually will be the opportunity going forward. But, but specific to your question, from an oil price perspective, um, we have got plenty of supply. OPEC is still important, um, but the U.S. will also play a, a critical role there as well. But for the energy sector to be successful, this is the most important part of it. We just need stable oil prices, stable energy prices. And we think the setup is, is pretty strong for the next decade to have stable, consistent energy prices, which then allow a lot of the companies and, and the cash flows that they're generating to continue to grow. And that's what investors will, re uh, will reward going forward. Your three winners, the stocks you like for next year, why those three in particular? Yeah, so energy infrastructure is a place here at Tortoise that we really love um, for, for a lot of reasons. First of all, uh, energy is essential. And if you're going to transport energy, if the U.S. is going to export more energy, we need more energy infrastructure. We need existing infrastructure to facilitate that export growth going forward that's going to happen in 2020 and beyond. So companies like Enterprise Products that pays a dividend yield of almost 6.5% uh, owns critical energy infrastructure, have raised their dividend for over a decade every single year. Right. Other companies like Williams Companies, once again, another 6.5% dividend yielder. Magellan Midstream, another 6.5% dividend yielder. Investors really, from our perspective, Bill, um, are starving for yield. You know, the, the S&P 500 yields 1.5%. 0.9%, the 10-year Treasury yields 1.8%. You need dividend yields as an investor, and we think energy infrastructure is a great place to, to find some of those dividend yields. By the way, quickly, uh, you mentioned natural gas. Prices have floundered for a number of years because of an oversupply. Do you see that ending at some point? Well, first of all, natural gas is uh, probably one of the most critical commodities going forward. We need to lower carbon emissions basically globally, right? And the playbook in the U.S., and not a lot of people know this, but Carbon emissions in the U.S. have declined in the last 10 years. One of the reasons for that is because of the increased use of natural gas in the electricity sector to, to generate electricity. So that needs to be applied globally, and it will be in the next decade. And if we, if we apply the same formula in the U.S. globally in the next decade and eliminate coal and increase natural gas and renewables, we'll end up reducing carbon emissions globally. And so we think natural gas plays a really critical role. The price, right. the price uh, can stay low, if, and, and that actually will boost demand going forward. Very good. Rob Thummel with Tortoise Advisors. Again, thanks for joining us tonight, Rob. Thank you, Bill. You bet. Time to take a look at some of today's upgrades and downgrades. We begin with shares of Tesla. Their price target was raised to $370 from $270 at Wedbush. The analysts cited demand for the automaker's Model 3 here in the U.S. and in Europe, which should help profitability. But the firm is recommending a wait-and-see approach to the stock itself. It's maintaining its neutral rating right now. The stock rose more than 1% today to 430.94. Kyogen was reinstated with an underperform rating in Bank of America. The analysts there cited the Dutch biotech company's decision to remain independent after ending takeover talks with various potential suitors, all of which was announced late Tuesday. Price target now $28. Kyogen lost 20% of its value today to close at 32.91. Spectrum Pharmaceuticals was downgraded to neutral from overweight at Cantor Fitzgerald. The analysts cited the failure of the company's experimental lung cancer treatment in a mid-stage trial. Price target $4, and shares of that small cap dropped by 60% on that news today to $3.50. Still ahead, slow and steady stocks for a slow and steady recovery. Our market monitor has some names to consider. And a reminder that many international markets were closed for Boxing Day today. the economy now and a couple of reports on jobs and housing. First, the number of Americans filing for unemployment benefits fell by 13,000 last week to 222,000. Jobless claims are usually volatile around the holiday season and at the end of the year. Elsewhere, there was a 3.5% pullback in the number of mortgage applications last week. Mortgage rates themselves moved a tiny bit higher over that period, almost a 4% on average now. And now that Christmas is over, tis the season for returns, and there are more of them thanks to the rise of e-commerce. Frank Holland is back with that story. 
A record $95 billion in holiday returns is projected for this holiday season, with nearly half coming from e-commerce. The most return items are expected to be women's clothing, appliances, and toys. Moody's retail analyst Charlie O'Shea says the growing return culture can also be a boost to retailers' post-holiday sales. It's a win for a retailer if they get you in the store to return something, because then they get another bite at the apple. So we think retailers need to really leverage that opportunity. According to a new survey from XBO Logistics, 9% of brick and mortar purchases are returned compared to 30% of online sales. And 83% of those online shoppers consider the return policy before they buy. Amazon announced free returns on millions of items this holiday season. The tech giant gets more than a third of all online sales. UPS says it expects its peak day for online returns to be January 2nd when 1.9 million packages will be sent back, a 26% increase over last year. Those returns, they also have a growing cost for retailers. CBRE estimates retailers lose $50 billion per year because of inefficient logistics handling returns. The return culture, it's a key part of the evolving e-commerce landscape that Oppenheimer analyst Brian Nagel says is shifting to actually attracting customers to brick and mortar stores. Most of the retailers I follow talk about buy online, pick up in store, representing 50% upwards of 70% of their online sales. So that consumers going online, purchasing the product, but then subsequently going to the store and, and picking it up. Estimates have online returns increasing by 15% or more next year, while brick and mortar returns are expected to increase by low single digits. Companies like UPS and FedEx that handle many of those returns are expected to see a big boost in their volumes and their revenues. For Nightly Business Report, Frank Holland. Amazon said today it had a record-breaking holiday season, and its shares have seen solid gains so far this year. But the stock is also doing something it hasn't done in years. Deirdre Bosa takes a look at what's next for one of 2019's most talked-about companies. Amazon has been one of the best performing stocks of the last decade, but it could end the streak on a more lackluster note. This year, Amazon is on track to underperform the benchmark S&P 500 for the first time since 2014. Back then, the company was under pressure for its lack of profit and falling operating margin. This time around, Wall Street is more forgiving of Amazon's so-called investment year. Shares have returned nearly 20% so far, and many are predicting the groundwork has been laid for a bigger breakout next year. Because it's an investment year for Amazon, and, and, and the stock never outperforms when they're an investment year. But it does tend to outperform the year after an investment year, because that's when you see the benefits. Except this time could be different. Amazon is facing new risks, and the cracks are starting to show as it heads into 2020. They include declining dominance in e-commerce and cloud, rising competition, antitrust concerns, and an uncertain regulatory environment in an election year. There's also growing concerns about the safety and quality of its marketplace. Amazon has been one of the past decade's most rewarding bets. It's far from guaranteed that it can do it again over the next 10 years. Nightly Business Report, Deirdre Boza, San Francisco. PayPal will look for takeover targets next year. That's where we begin with tonight's market focus. The company's chief financial officer tells the Wall Street Journal there are many acquisition opportunities in the payment sector. It will be targeting future deals in the $1 to $3 billion range. Shares rose a fraction today to 109.75. Tiffany said that overall sales for the holiday period increased, rising 1 to 3 percent globally from early November through Christmas Eve. The stock rose three cents to 133.62. Private equity firm KKR is buying Overdrive. That is a digital platform that helps libraries and schools deliver digital content to users. Value of the deal was not disclosed. Stock was up a fraction, though, to 29.28 today. And the FDA has accepted Immunomedics application for fast approval of its breast cancer treatment. The medicine is for the treatment of an advanced form of that disease. Shares gained more than 5.5% today to 21.67. All this week, we're getting you ready for the new year by bringing back some familiar market monitors. And tonight's guest has some all-weather stocks that he says will protect your portfolio during a slow, steady economy. Last time he was on as a market monitor was in July of 18. He recommended Anthem, which is up 23% over that time. Apple was up 51%. And Google parent Alphabet is up 14% since he recommended them. 
Andy Caprin's back with us. He's director of research at Region Atlantic. Good to see you again. Welcome it's back. Uh, Vanguard REIT uh, ETF. You're going for slowly and steady there, aren't you? So, Bill, I'm calling this the Rolling Stones recovery because just when you think they're finally out, they're not going to tour anymore, they, they go in and they announce another, uh, another farewell tour, if you will. Um, in that kind of a recovery, even the Stones are slowing, slowing down. They're not hitting as many cities as they used to. Right. Um, what, what that means is growth is going to be there, but it's going to be slower. And what I've identified are three investment ideas that I think are going to do well in that kind of slow but steady growth environment. And you feel real estate does well in the latter stages of a recovery, Exactly. Right? So that's why you like this one. Be because when the economy is getting more mature, when things are slowing down, you care a lot more about underlying cash flows and the stability of those cash flows. And that's where real estate really matters. It's basically the ultimate subscription model. Your lease, you're locked into it for at least a year. If, you, if it's like a commercial lease, you, you're often locked into it for 10 years. So a lot of predictability, a, a, a lot of stability. And it tends to be a sector that does best when the economy is mature and going more slowly. I guess it's no surprise then if you're going for stability, you like a, a utility. And mm -hmm. you've chosen Exelon in this particular case. Pretty good dividend. Why else do you like it? So I like Exelon because their geography focuses on the upper northeast. Um, it's a relatively well-established well and stable business model. They're also a relatively low carbon emitter, um, which is becoming more, more important as people focus more on environmental, social, and governance principles as they identify investments for their portfolio. Finally, I'm not sure I would think of uh, AT&T these days mm -hmm. when I think stability. Yeah, back in the day, yeah. yes. But now they're transforming themselves into this media company with a lot of challenges right now. So it is precisely because of that transformation that I think they are a good bet for a stable but slow economy. So what have they done over the past few years? They've gone from being a stodgy old telecom with a wireless unit that was big, but that was all that they really had, to a horizontally integrated um, to, uh, media company. Yep. So they own HBO and Time Warner. They own the actual pipes that get that to, 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 to the destination, to the customer. Um, they can really build on this. One, they can consolidate, pay off some of the debt that they, uh, that they used to acquire Time Warner. Um, number two, they can go into a subscription model like Netflix. That's already what they're doing with HBO Max and HBO Go. Um, it's a really good opportunity for them to stabilize their business model, be more diversified, and be a good bet for, for a slow but steady economy. Very good. Andy Caprin with Region Atlantic. Thank Always you, good Bill. to see you. Thank you. Happy New Year. And coming up, leaving paradise, why California is losing a generation of wage earners. The federal government is taking another step to try and integrate the use of commercial drones into national airspace. The FAA is proposing a rule that would require most drones operating in the U.S. to be equipped with remote tracking technology. The regulator says it expects all drones to be in compliance within three years of finalizing that rule. Finally tonight, California, as you may know, is the world's fifth largest economy, but a growing number of its residents are packing up and moving out. Jane Wells tells us why the Golden State seems to be losing its shine. California used to be the place where everyone dreamed of going. Now people dream of leaving. My economic situation there was uh, not great. Um. <laughs> Sydney Mulkey is a 30-year-old educator from Oakland who was living with her grandmother to make ends meet. At one point I was working three jobs <laughs> and I was just really tired, so... That was kind of the last straw. So she moved to Portland, Oregon, where she got the same job for more pay and was able to buy a brand new townhouse. Danielle and Scott Fortier are Los Angeles natives who picked up and moved their family and small business to Nashville. We've been here about six months, and in that six months, we've already had six friends of ours, six couples, relocate to the same area also. These are not isolated examples. The U.S. Census Bureau says California had a net loss of 190,000 people last year. That's still a relatively small number, but it's a growing trend. People have this image of all these old people who are frustrated leaving, but actually the ones who are leaving are, are family age people, people 30 to 54, that group. That's the group that's leaving. 
For the Fortiers, moving to Nashville has allowed them to save for retirement. Scott no longer has to work 80-hour weeks. They traded in this 3,100-square-foot house on a small lot in L.A. for a larger house on seven acres in Tennessee, which even includes a building for their business. Property taxes in California were about $7,200 a year, and our property taxes here are $2,800 a year. Migration out of California could have national implications. The state's unique culture of innovation took decades to build and benefited the entire country, attracting the best and brightest from around the world. That is not easily recreated somewhere else. There is no substitute for California. When somebody moves from California to Dallas, they may live a better life. Will they have the same impact they would have had had they been in California? I'm not so sure. But do these millennials miss California? I think leaving our family was the hardest part. Yeah, I do, um, especially on <laughs> days like today when it's just rainy and gloomy and very dark at 7.30 in the morning. But California's great weather may no longer be enough. For Nightly Business Report, Jane Wells, Los Angeles. And before we go, a final look at the record closes on Wall Street today. The Dow up 105, NASDAQ above 9,000 for the first time ever and the S&P rose by 16. That is Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Bill Griffith. Thanks for watching. Have a great evening. See you tomorrow.